Preserving the natural beauty of an aging landscape can be a daunting task. We'll visit the site of a success story in Bayfield, where restoration and community pride play a major role. That's coming up next on this edition of Great Gardening. Every tree has a moment when it shines. That's called money wart or creeping jenny. You can go in and do a rejuvenating pruning. Forage and feed for our native pollinator population. A garden really gives you peace of mind. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening. I'm Pamela Fish and I am joined by our resident garden experts, Bob Olin, horticulturist and educator with St. Louis County, and Tom Casper, the president of Duluth Garden Flower Society and Duluth Community Garden Program board member. And hey, how about this weather? It Beautiful. feels like spring, almost even summer. Yes, <laughs> uh, this is what we've been waiting for. That's right, yeah. right. So what does that foretell? Well, <laughs> Obviously, we're, it seems like we're off to an early start. Mm -hmm. It's a real temptation to get started, but uh, as you know, the forecast for next week is back to normal conditions. So always this time of year, you know, you got the bug. You may have to plant a few things. We've started. Gloom and doom bugs. <laughs> <laughs> We've started, but you got to hold most of it back sure. because uh, we'll probably return to reality soon. All right. Yeah, but anything we can get done now, you know, comparative <laughs> last year on this date, we act, or two years ago on this date, we canceled the show, I think. I know, I know, because, because of, of a snowstorm. Yeah. yeah. So we don't, whatever, wanna, we don't wanna remember that. Yeah. <laughs> whatever we get done is, is kind of uh, oh, yeah. stuff ahead, you know. Well, so. we'll talk more a little bit later on uh, what to consider in uh, early planting or too early planting. But we wanna also welcome our phone volunteers from the St. Louis County Master Gardeners. They are standing by to answer your called in questions. So please give them a call. The numbers are there on your screen, 788-2884. There's a toll free number you can call as well. And we also have an email address. So keep our phone volunteers busy tonight. Well, as uh, we mentioned, with the conditions that we've had in recent days, it might be uh, tempting to, to jump the gun on things a little bit. That's a temptation. You know, um, I have to admit, Tom, I have jumped the gun. <laughs> <laughs> but, but only a small amount. You, you hold most of your powder back, and, but you just got to get out there. So if people want to get started, uh, you can do a little tilling where it's drier. You can plant uh, certainly the salad greens from seed. Anything that's frost sensitive, of course, we want to stay away from entirely. But, you know, we might get lucky and you might be able to protect some of these things. So if you just got to go ahead, uh, certainly go ahead. And you can do a little bit of transplanting of uh, some of the perennials and yeah. so forth. That we certainly can do. Yeah, and, and certainly wanting to, if your per perennials are coming up or some of those things, you want to get whatever is left from last year's growth out of there while that stuff is small. The longer you wait as it grows, the harder it will be to be to do it without damage, so. Okay, all right. And I think people, look, perhaps one thing that they shouldn't do that they're tempted is get a lot of fertility on the lawn at this point. Let's let things start to grow first so that when you do make those applications, uh, the plant can take advantage of it. I was doing a little digging and in certain places there still is frost in the ground. So we have to be a little conscious of uh, just where we're at. We've got to follow the calendar as well as the thermometer. Okay, all right, thanks much. Well, right now, we want to show you a unique landscape project in Bayfield, Wisconsin with an innovative pond system that has melded beautifully with the natural environment. It was a well on the property that just, and there was an old building around it so I redid the building you know, it was structurally sound and then put the rock that was rejected from the house project and made, you know, made it a rock well house that kind of emanized the 18th century well house or spring house. That well furnishes this water, but this water is circulated. We call it the pond area, but on the other hand, uh, we think it's a remarkable project. And Bob raised the question, would we be interested in a bog filter pond, which neither Marilyn and I had ever heard of. So we had to dig this and, and uh, put a rubber liner underneath and then filled it back with rock on top of the rubber liner so the water would hold. And everything here that has water in it has got a rubber liner under it. 
you know, including the wetland vegetation there. Nothing would grow there. We dug a hole and put a rubber liner and filled it with muck from the swamp and planted those uh, plants that I brought in from my farm. And they seem to be happy there. Well, the iris, the ferns, and uh, the hostas are not exactly wild, but they were from this area right here on the, along the shore. And different kinds of ferns, and uh, well, we brought in the forget-me-nots. That's, they're around, but they're domesticated also, but they grow wild around the water. And I brought in a lot of things that were just weeds, but they were green and had a nice leaf shape to them. Stuff that I dug out of my own wetland. This is the best year. This year is the, the best year that they've been back. You know, and planted a lot of them were only planted last year, some the year before. Planting slowly to see what grows. You have to have the right balance of vegetation. Kind of starve them with no soil and that stimulates them to go after the nutrients in the water. Today, if you look at it with only two years of maturation, it, uh, it appears to be uh, a stream that's been here since the glacial years. And uh, we think it's a very, very nice extension of our property. Well, we were so impressed when we got to go visit that site. I wanted to mention that uh, the developer, Bob Mick, not a landscaper by profession. He's a land surveyor, but uh, says he did most of the work through research and trial and error. You know, a beautiful site. He's done a yeah. nice job. You know, I think what you can learn from that is he's used a lot of the native materials. And if you can just observe what's in the natural environment and then try to replicate that, you're always uh, a little bit farther ahead rather than bringing in materials from adjacent areas or places where sure. they may not be appropriate. So he's done a very nice job. Yeah. There we right. Congratulated. Absolutely. Absolutely stunning. We're going to go back to Van Zandt's to see how restoration of a trail and construction of a bridge there revitalized the area for the community as well. But right now, you know what's happening because you guys are getting questions thrown at you already. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, we're going to start with Clyde from Barnum who is cutting, wondering about cutting raspberries. Is it too late? You know, uh, for most of our raspberries, you're going to take out last year's canes if that hasn't been done yet. And any time uh, you can do that, the sooner the better. And then you also want to take a look at this year's canes that are going to flower and fruit. And take a look at the cane, and you can see where there's actually been tip burn, die back, and bring it down to one of the green swelling buds. So you can give them a haircut across the top and take mm -hmm. out all of last year's canes. So definitely not too late. No, right. right on time. Right on time. Oh, good. That's I, uh, Clyde should be happy to hear that. <laughs> uh, Janet from Duluth, here's a good question. Suggestions for cemetery baskets that the deer won't eat. You know, they always look so beautiful when you put yeah. them out there with all those lush annuals. But. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, and one of the things you can look for are some of the scented geraniums really work well for that, and they're really drought tolerant. So looking for, the, and there's some of the lemon scented or citrus scented geraniums that work pretty good in a setting like that. But a lot of those other um, annuals, uh, you know, when the deer are hungry, um, it's open game. They're going to go after them, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's one thing nice about a green up. As soon as we get a little bit more of a green up, there's more, more feed, then you can uh, probably feel a little bit more secure setting some things out. But it's, yeah. again, very early to be setting out the annuals and other things in uh, cemetery baskets. Yeah. Okay. Barbara from Island Lake wants to know if um, Roundup is sprayed on grass around a vegetable garden. Would it be safe to plant your vegetables in May? So, so I guess the question is how long do you leave it before you plant anything there? Yeah, she should. Uh, first, uh, you know, it's what we call a non-selective. So anything that's green is going to have impact on it. It does break down when it hits the soil. So uh, early like this, I don't think that there should be a, a real issue there at all for her. But, but just with, with all herbicides or any kind of product, you want to make sure, of course, that you, you stay on your target. You don't want any drift. So you want to be conscious. Uh, so you want to spray in the early evening or uh, when it's very, very calm. Yep. And the other thing to keep in mind is, is as Bob mentioned, non-selective contact herbicide. So she wants to make sure she's contacting live, actively growing tissue. So okay. um, a lot of our plants still haven't come up yet. So she doesn't want to go out and spray it now if it isn't green. Wait till it greens up and then spray it. All right. Good information. Um, these are some of the questions that I picked up at the home show. Uh, some of our viewers might remember that we were there last week. We had a great time at the Arrowhead Home and Builders show with a live audience and people came all weekend long. So they were asking things like, 
Uh, Linda from South Range, who has a four-year-old blueberry plant, uh, she thinks it's a high bush and thinks that the mice ate around the base of the branches and then those, some of those branches split. Can anything be done with those plants? You know, it all depends on the extent of the damage. Obviously, if you actually uh, circumscribe any limb, that will typically kill it. The, the good news is if there are varieties that are appropriate for this area, and she may not have high bush because we really don't have too many high bush, true mm -hmm. high bush that make it through the winter, probably has the half eyes, and uh, they're very, very resilient. They'll come back from the roots. So if it looks as if, uh, you know, the canes really aren't going to butt out or there's quite a bit of damage, don't hesitate to just prune those right at the ground level. In many cases, we need to get some of them out uh, anyway. So take a good look. What doesn't look real like it's really vigorous, take it out at, right at the ground anyway. They'll come back from the roots. And they'll come back. We don't need to take them all the way out and replant them. No, I wouldn't be taking them out and replanting. I would okay. just uh, let them regrow from the roots. And uh, when they begin to break bud, now this is time of year, a little bit of an acid acidifying fertilizer, an ammonium sulfate or something like that, that's the time you want to apply within maybe the next two or three weeks. And that'll help encourage new growth. And, and certainly the kind of winter that we had this past winter was mm -hmm. pretty good for a lot of our fruits and things like that because it was a pretty mild winter. So a lot of the blueberries should have done pretty well. And, and unfortunately, she had some that were damaged yeah. by something, rodents, whether it was voles or rabbits or mm -hmm. mice. Um, so um, certainly getting in and getting uh, those cleaned up and, and probably going to be a good year for blueberries. So I hope so. We yes, didn't get the, as much snow as we'd like, but we didn't have the severely cold temperatures either. And the flower buds I've seen look pretty, pretty strong, so I think we're going to have a good year. Okay. Kathy from Ganeson Township saw where you take toilet paper to make seed tape. You can use a flour and water paste and then put the seeds on it. And I think she said she rolled it up or let it dry somehow. How does that work? Have you heard of this? I've sure. actually done that. Okay. <laughs> and we did and that did as a tip on the yes, show years with, ago. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. Okay, before my time, but how did it work? Well, the whole concept is you're spacing the plants out. So uh, space it out, be a little careful. You know, they want, only want to go in a quarter inch, so don't, uh, don't plant them too deep. The real key is to continue to apply moisture on a regular basis until they've sprouted. So. The biggest uh, benefit is just spacing, and then uh, it tends to deteriorate uh, relatively quickly. And, okay. and you can buy those ready-made as well. There's seed tape that's ready to go for you. The, so. the seed tapes are a little right. bit more durable, so they're going to stay yeah. in place. Mm -hmm. But uh, don't be surprised if this breaks down relatively quickly for you. But if the seeds get established, it's, it's fun. A great kid project, and that's what we did with it. Lots of All fun. right, mm -hmm. good. Okay, Luann wants a privacy plant between the house and the neighbor. It's a pretty shady area. Not real large, but could support smaller pines and would maybe like something year-round there. Any thoughts? And, and uh, no cedar it because of like the deer. It doesn't like the cedar because of the deer, yeah. <laughs> she did say that. Luann, Luann we are out of options. Um, pretty tough to find something that does shade. As far as a pine, most of the, our evergreens, excluding a cedar, and even a cedar really does better in some sunlight. So looking for an evergreen other than maybe a yew, um, but they also are deer candy as well in the winter time. So yeah. whatever she plants, she may have to think about um, protection in the winter. As far as an understory deciduous, look for some of the viburnums. They do well in a sort of a semi-shade kind of condition and are relatively narrow or upright, like uh, the compact cranberry bush or something like that. Sure. So That's good. Maybe the one option would be, you know, we've got some smaller dwarf spruce which might be your only option that would tolerate, uh, but they're a little bit more, considerably more deer resistant. So that would be the only evergreen that might uh, do reasonably yeah. well and stay relatively compact. All right, let's take one more before we move on. It's from Catherine in Mackinac who has had moss growing for years, but now it's spread and as she's raking the lawn, she sees that that moss is uh, spreading underneath and becoming invasive. You know, we're seeing more of that, particularly after oh. last year. And what people need to know and understand about moss is that it doesn't have a root system, meaning it doesn't have active transport of water. So if it's living, it's pulling all the moisture in through its tissue itself. So what that says to me, it's wet, wet, wet. And it may have been last year, but more than likely, the trees are growing up around that lot and shading it. And as a consequence, the moisture levels are just uh, never drying down. So. One option really is to uh, try to thin the trees down a bit. Thin them or take one or two down, get some more sunlight in there, improve the drainage, and, and that's probably your ultimate solution. 
All right, sounds good. We'll have more questions coming up later. But right now we want to go back to a home in Bayfield where homeowners, with the help of a talented project manager, achieved a pretty amazing historic preservation, keeping conservation in mind. My name is Bill Van Sant. We're currently on a part of the property that my wife and I acquired when we built our new home in 2010. We bought uh, the property across the ravine from behind me, back this way. Uh, I had a small home that we took down to build a house. And subsequent to buying that, the owner of this property called and said, would you be interested in buying our undeveloped property, which is this property? And we bought it with no idea what to do with it, except Bob said, we're gonna have to reinstate the, uh, uh, the ditch along the old railway right away. And we said, well, can you put a bridge over it so we could get into this field if we want to? And he said, I think so. That's how it started. As we were developing this property, we realized the significance of the Brownstone Trail, which was the old railroad property. The first thing we said is, I wonder if we could restore that old ravine to its original state, like it was when it was a railroad, and, uh, and you know work on this path through here, including some uh, bank restoration work you did over there, yep. Bob. So if you go down there today, it looks like it did in 1870. You know, also everything goes back to its natural state. The bridge was supposed to be 40 feet long, but every time they took out a scoop full of, uh, of the fill, uh, you know, the sides would slough off and sloughed off and sloughed off. It got back to its natural sort of profile. So now the bridge is 60 foot long. We enjoy the people that come along the path. We met people from New York and Kansas and all over. It's amazing how many people express uh, gratefulness for the bridge. This is a honeycomb material that actually Bob found on, uh, on some of his, during some of his research. And the entire area, including the grass area, is covered. But out here, he filled the grid with dirt and then seeded it so he had a grass area. And then he put uh, rock in here because he has a ground drain that runs through here that runs surface water off to the ravine. We decided to design an on-purpose, full-site drain system it would minimize the flow off of, of surface water from our lot into the lake. So the driveway is all brick, but under the brick is about a 15 inch, I think, crushed rock base and with uh, perforated drain pipe. So as the rain oozes down through the, the brick, the opening between the bricks, the water runs off into a dry run creek we put on the other side of the house that again acts as a filtration system. So, you know, Saving the beauty of this place and enjoying the historical and rich uh, artifacts and, and history is a, a great part of our life. Again, our thanks for letting us tour there. I wanted to mention that honeycomb grid that uh, was really sturdy, so they were able to use that area for overflow parking, but uh, pretty amazing project all yeah, around indeed. in that and, landscape. And seeing a lot of that in, in a lot of major communities where they're using that as driveways and things like that mm -hmm. because it's permeable and, and isn't causing the problems with runoff and things like that. Mm -hmm. So becoming very popular around the country. So. Yeah, okay. All right, well, let's get back to some more questions from our viewers. Uh, Larry from Hermantown wants to know how to get rid of fire blight, has already pruned radically and used what he called a bacterial side, bacterial side, but I think you you wanted to say that was maybe yeah. an antibiotic of some uh, uh, some type. Uh, what can he do now? Okay, um, you know he's talking about fire blight, which is mm -hmm. really the uh, the nemesis of a lot of trees. Something we're really concerned about. Why we've always advised never prune during the growing season, always during the dormant period. When you have open wounds, you don't want the, the bacterial spores. So really, he's been trying antibiotics, which he's called the bacterial side. Uh, there are a number of them, agostrep. They're all streptomycin derivatives. As in his situation, I've not had any luck with them, so I don't really advise people uh, okay. to do that. I would say that um, if it's real severe, he may have to start over with these trees. He may all have right. to take them out. And then for anyone else, I think you want to prune very, very carefully. We don't want the open wounds. We don't want to over prune because that's very stimulative. I just don't think we can fall back and rely on any kind of uh, anti antibiotic uh, treatment. And, right. and for Treat folks that are asking mm -hmm. about what is fire blight and, mm -hmm. and the problem, it's really um, a lot with our fruit trees, uh, apples oh. and, and things like that. So getting in and getting that prune pruning done 
If you haven't done it by now, very soon from now, but, and so it's gonna give that tree time to heal before those bud breaks. So you're probably running out of time very soon. So. Okay, that reminds me, I had a tree question that was uh, emailed to me a couple weeks ago. Lynn's putting up a new garage this spring, has a 20 foot Ammer maple, am I saying that right? Mm -hmm. Ammer maple, in the, and has, is it worth saving and how do I go about moving it? Um, it she can probably, I mean, you could move it. It's gonna be expensive to yeah. move. Uh, they do well here readily, so she could go in and probably find those available at many garden centers. They're almost considered a noxious weed. They, they self-seed and grow readily, so maybe she could go into the woods or somewhere and get the, a good size replacement start or a couple good one. size replacements and start over. Okay, that thanks much. Yeah. All right, <laughs> I have a couple compost questions for you. Okay, first, Suzanne in Duluth is using WLSSD compost for vegetables. Do I need to add anything or just use the compost? The big thing is she has to realize all composts are amendments, they're not complete soils. Mm -hmm. So you never want to incorporate more than 10 or 15 percent. You want your organic levels up to maybe 10 percent. So you start with the mineral soil and you add compost. You don't try to grow just in the compost. Other than that, it's a nice source of nutrient. Uh, make sure that it is completely cured. For some people, they may even let it sit for a little while and then incorporate it. But uh, very good product and yeah, uh, the WLSSD is and uh, again we appreciate their support. We appreciate their support. <laughs> They're doing the right thing with uh, with a lot of our organic ways to get That's them right. back in. Yeah. Teresa has a compost pile and has creeping Charlie in it. So can she use the compost without getting creeping Charlie elsewhere? Probably not. I yeah. mean, if it's got oh, roots it. in it, she'll yeah. want to leave it set a little longer. Keep mixing it. Try mm -hmm. to get the air flow through it and good moisture, let it heat up another year or probably before she even tries that without worrying about the potential of getting it. Now she could go in, the roots are readily identifiable and try to get those roots out either through screening or some other mechanism and take her chance with reduced amount of Creeping Charlie by, right. by screening it, so. Okay. It's so invasive, we really don't want to spread it around. Yeah. Um, we have, we're gonna take time for one more because this is a really kind of a Creepy, scary question. Bonnie from Proctor says, what's wrong with my strawberries? They have a cluster of worms on the tip, half inch long, light brown, looks like little snakes. <laughs> she says, the berries are nice inside and beautifully red and ripe. At this time? Well, <laughs> I guess, I, yeah, I, I'm not sure if this is a question from last year's berries because they wouldn't be ripe yet, but I, I was assuming when I first read that that was the plant, but. Yeah. We, this is one of those questions where we really like to see a little bit more information yeah. or talk with her a little bit about it because uh, it, there are a couple things here that don't quite fit together. And okay. mo most of the, uh, uh, you know, the Lepidoptera and so forth that would cause problems uh, don't quite exactly match what she's describing in there. So unless you have some other suggestions. No, I, it, yeah, it doesn't quite mix together. Mm -hmm. So it'd be nice if she could send us a yeah, picture. Yeah, we're not sure if those are the plants or those are the, it sounds like they're the berries, but they wouldn't be this year's berries. No, and, and okay. whatever, um, whatever larvae is doing the damage, uh, they typically are rather insignificant. We've got some major insect pests on strawberries, but uh, that doesn't seem to be one of them. Hmm. So. Okay, all right, new one on us, but we'd love to hear more. All right, um, we're gonna move on. I we might have time for a couple more questions coming up later, but for this week's Grow and Show segment, we take you just a bit up the North Shore where a wide assortment of plant life blooms all season long. At her home in Two Harbors, Betty Bennett started some 20 ornamental crabapple trees from tiny seedlings and now relishes the riot of color each spring. Her front yard gardens see iris and lupin bloom near the dwarf lilac. The daylily blossoms will come later to brighten the border in front of a weeping spruce. Betty tries to keep the bittersweet vine in check as it encroaches along the fence of a garden including hollyhocks and lettuce she keeps in pots. While the lamb's ear grows lush in front of yellow loosestrife. This standout Baunica shrub rose was a gift from a friend that just keeps on giving. As do Betty's William Baffin roses, one that climbs in an open grove, another nestled with ladies mantle against the porch rail a perfect place to stop and smell the roses. If you have garden pictures to share, 
please email them to greatgardening at wdsc.org or send to 632 Niagara Court, Duluth, and let us show what you grow. All right. Well, thanks again for sending those pictures in. We appreciate when uh, viewers send them in because everybody has beautiful pictures to share. We're going to take time, take a crack at a couple more questions. And uh, one of them is, is there any organic herbicide to effectively kill common tansy? Um, or do I just have to cover it with black poly? This is from Ed in Saginaw. It's a real good question because uh, if he wants to use something organic, um, I really don't think we have anything that's going to be effective. It, Tansy's got such a super root system okay. underneath it that I think uh, going to the black poly and mm -hmm. covering, myself I'd probably dig it first and you're not going to get it all and then be prepared to cover it because they're, they're so powerful that they could penetrate a lot of black poly. Uh, one of the organic herbicides, vinegar, let me tell you, you'll burn the top off. It's not going to have any in impact long-term on tansy. So save your money, save your time. How long do I cover it, he wants to know, too, with that black poly? Believe it or not, dig it, and you're going to have to cover it for a season, and, and you can't really okay. have any shoots that penetrate through the plastic, or it'll revitalize re, uh, the entire root rhizome system. All right, going to take Tough a little lead. while. All right, we, we have time for uh, at least one more. Leanne and Cloquet has sandy soil, pine trees, and a maple tree that's five years old with, uh, for the last two years had black nodules on the leaves. So black nodules could be a couple different things. Mm -hmm. It could be a mite if it's more of a nodule more than likely or uh, we've talked about and seen the last couple of years is the uh, tar spot on leaves. So it could be one of those two things. In both cases, more than likely not going to significantly impact the health of the tree over the long term. But good cleanup in the fall or this spring, getting those leaves that might uh, harbor those problems over the winter. Um, good sanitation, get them off site rather than in the compost and right. should be a better year for it. So. And okay. the other thing, Tom, she's on light sandy soils, so she has to be very conscious of uh, nutrient, nutrient availability. So trees don't require a lot of nutrition, but if you're going to fertilize just as the buds begin to break is the one time, particularly on a sandy soil like that, that'll increase the vigor of the plant. Mm -hmm. All right, we're running out of time, but I want to mention that later this month, the annual spring garden extravaganza organized by our own Bob Olin in St. Louis County Extension is, is coming up. And uh, Bob, that's when? It's going to be the 25th out at Hermandown High School. Lots of fun. We're going to do uh, something on gardening and good health. I've never put together a more diverse group of speakers. Uh, everything from yoga in the garden to growing asparagus, growing potatoes, as, as well as a little bit of feng shui. All right. You can find out more about that if you want to link to our website. There's our web address right there. It sounds like a lot of fun, Bob. Well, that's all the time we have left. I want to thank you, Bob Olin, Tom Casper. Thanks to our phone volunteers from St. Louis County Master Gardeners. And from all of us here, thanks for watching and enjoy the garden. <laughs>